Hi, I'm Jeff. This is Tropical Plants at 53 degrees north. Back with another video. And this is all about some more tropical greenhouse jobs for October. Nothing more to say, so let's dive in. And we are in. And I'll just start off with this cymbidium. So this is, I think, a plant you've not seen before. I have had it a couple of years. I've had it outside for the most part. I just tend to bring it in over winter. I think I can leave it out over winter. Maybe somebody can uh, chip in on that. I've never looked it up really. Yeah, but I tend to bring it in just because obviously if it's outside, I can't enjoy it quite the same now that we're not spending as much time outside. And of course, because the blooms don't look anywhere near as nice once they've been bashed about by the weather. So I'm not really sure how I feel about it. I, I've seen nicer cymbidiums, let's just say, it, but it does photograph quite well. Um, if you're not following me on Instagram, then have a look at the link in my description and you'll be able to go follow me over there if you want to see some of my plant photos. It's okay. I quite, I'm quite. i not going to get rid of it, put it that way. It's all right. I quite like it, but I have seen some nicer cymbidiums in this. Um, it's got quite a long name, um, which I can't remember. Uh, cymbidium erythrostylum cross with Dianum variety Simoncianum, I think. Uh, no scent to it, but it's all right. It's okay. Like I say, it's been out most of the year, um, well, most of the season from spring onwards. And I've just brought it in now as the blooms are opening up, just so that I could enjoy the blooms a little bit more closely. So we're talking about more tropical greenhouse jobs. And I'm just going to do like a little bit of a tour of one or two things that's happening in the greenhouse. Um, I don't know if you've seen this. I have no idea what it's called. So some kind of pilea, I think. Um, it is kind of growing on me. It's changing as time goes on. These really weird, I guess the blooms, are changing pretty quickly. Um, I'll have to look that up and find out a little bit more about it. It was a present from a friend. So, more jobs. Well, definitely insulation. So all the louvre windows are all insulated now, uh, inside and out. So that was a weak point from last year. So that's that done. And I also thought that this bit here around the partition, I need some more up there. I don't really think that's enough. Um, and I'd like a little bit more on this side as well. But I don't want to cover up that really handy shelf there where I've got my, how do I pronounce that? Escinanthus hot flash, Escinanthus, I think. And that's doing really nice with the blooms, but it's not really growing a great deal. It's just chucking up these blooms. Well, it's really nice. It's supposed to be a trailer. So I'm looking forward to that coming along. And you've probably seen my Epicat layer. And this again, it just keeps throwing things up. And I'll just put my notes down here because I know I've shown you this before, but they're growing so quickly. I mean, look at this. This is going to make a video, isn't it, of uh, what to do with this. I guess I'm going to have to repot it in something like that. Catlier's repotted in over there. I'll see if I can get those roots contained a little bit because I don't like them when they're going like this. And it looks like there's going to be another one over there, another bloom. And while we're over here, I know this isn't a job, but we'll just show you we've got um, a spike there. That's coming on the brassier. And of course, the Zyga Pedalum over here, we've got two bloom spikes on that, so that's going to look really nice as well soon. So, yeah, insulation. So what else was I going to tell you about? Um, quick look at that. I'll just back up through the partition, and I'll show you some more of the jobs that I've done. So now, Pelagoniums. So this time of year, it's really nice to give them a real hard cut back. You can see I've done it there. Now those leaves that you can see there aren't looking that healthy at the moment because I've cut right back and all the, those leaves were covered. So I expect those to pop up again soon or some new growth to come soon. So as it comes to winter time, I mean, of course you can keep pelagoniums if you're keeping them at a decent temperature. And as you know, I keep it to 12 here. Then they will keep growing slowly. Uh, but what happens with them? They get very bushy. And they tend to find, you tend to find that the more bushy they are and the, the more leggy they get and the less blooms they have, you want them like a nice compact plant and they will then flower more for you. Of course, it, great, it gives you a little bit more room as well. So I've done that one there. There's another one down there that I've cut right back. There's another one just at the back there next to the 
fern and just over here this one i've left this one because it stayed quite compact anyway and as you can see there's some bloom buds on there and some bloom buds over there so i might as well enjoy those uh, even though it's quite late in the season so that's a job that wanted doing pelagoniums done the streptocarpus i did mention this you start they, they start to like naturally get yellowing leaves and get botrytis on the leaves um, all I do is I start picking at them now really you start picking at the leaves the ones that are really yellow or really discolored or you can see that they're really going over if they're nice and green great you just see in the middle there can you see right in the center just there where some of these leaves begin to get botrytis and go a little bit yuck so you start pulling those off um, keep pulling all the flowers off that have gone over keep cutting the flower spikes off and if you do pull at a flower spike you'll find that like the whole uh, like a little i don't know it's like a rosette comes out with it which is fine there, there is still everything you want is still in there it will come back next year this is just what naturally happens with streptocarpus now some of my streptocarpus that were brand new this year are really handily for me anyway putting on a really nice show now uh, they're late in the season to bloom because they're only really small plug plants so these will go absolutely fine right up until christmas i'm really happy with those you can see loads of nice varieties there and um, that begonia i'm quite pleased with that begonia whitey eye i um, don't really like begonia blooms much but i quite like those because uh, they've got those little pink wings that's quite nice and that streptocarpus ds frip it back there it must be a double I thought it hadn't opened up, but it's definitely opened up now as much as it's going to. And uh, then we've got a chocolate streptocarpus there. So that's streptocarpus. So I'm going to keep keep on at the streps and keep removing the leaves that are getting too big and the ones that are getting too yellow. And eventually, um, the ones that you can see are ready for a rest will go completely dormant. I'll, I'll pull all the bits off them and repot them if they need to be repotted so that's something that's going to start now and i'll still be doing that in december i think with all these that i've got uh, Calaria. so i'll just move over again to the Calaria. now i've read different things about these now obviously this one over here uh, what's this one i can't remember what i got to uh, well, that's the brazil gem um they do get very leggy and the leaves kind of lose the color now um again i've read various quite conflicting things on these they can and they do go dormant but they can and they do carry on <laughs> i think the confusion lies with the fact that there are quite a number of species plants and some they, they kind of come from different areas so some of the species do naturally go dormant and some of them don't now i know these two have been dormant because that's how they arrived they arrived uh, just as small rhizomes but that doesn't mean that they have to but looking at them I would suggest that maybe these ones, and there's the other one, I've cut all the flower spikes off that now, I would suggest that maybe these ones seem to want to go dormant. So I'm going to hold off, I'll just kind of hold off the watering a little bit and let them dry out a little bit and see what happens. If it looks like they've just, they've had it, then I, I will let them go dormant. Another problem might be uh, that they're actually in the side of the greenhouse where they're going to get too cold, so they're going to have to be moved over to the warm side. And that's something else that I'm doing at this time of year, moving things over. Um, I think my Adenium obesum is okay. I think it's going to bloom, but I don't know, it's kind of halted a little bit. We've got those nice red looking buds and then they've just kind of stopped now, Todd from Todd's Tropicals, uh, my mate over there in Florida, told me to hold off the watering a little bit because sometimes that can make the buds blast. Well, I'm certainly familiar with bud blast. That's something that uh, I've become extremely familiar with over the past few months. So hopefully these aren't going to do the same, but we'll see. I'll, I'll hold off the watering a little bit, although I did give it a sneaky water the other day. It's very difficult for a self-confessed waterholic like myself. So that's something else that's going on there. So the Calaria are going to be moved to the warm side. Um, I'll just show you over here. I've already moved my frangipanis, my plumerias. Um, they've, they've been okay this year. They've put some nice growth on. Uh, that one's doing okay. 
but coming over to this one, this one's doing fantastically well in its new spot. Seems to be doing better here than it did in the other side. Now, obviously, it's warmer in this side. I think it's just closer to the light. That could be it. Um, so that one, that one's okay. I think that one's red, red tourmaline. I hope I do get some flowers on that at some point. So yeah, moving things about is something that I need to make sure I do at this time of year. Just coming back to a pelagonium, this pelagonium here was a trailer. Now I've not completely cut it back and that's something that I did want to mention that's only just uh, reappeared in my brain. Now when you do strip them back, I know uh, various people, I'm thinking now of, what's his name, Mr. Pelagonium, David Taylor. He's the expert on it. He's got a great YouTube channel, so I'll go over there and have a look at his. And I think he's, well, I know he shows pelagoniums, he grew them in nurseries and so on. And he says at this time of year, you can completely defoliate your pelagoniums, you completely strip them back. Now, I did do that last year, and I'm not sure whether I just did it too late or not, but I completely lost one. I stripped it back, and it didn't, it didn't reappear, which was a shame, because it was one of my favourites as well. Um, I'm suspecting it was really, I did it too late, because obviously if you've still got some warmth, then it's more likely to be able to spring back to life. So what I've done this year instead is I've made sure that there's some leaf, leaves on it, some leaves on it, can't speak properly, got some leaves on it. Um, the Bougainvillea, it is very, very slowly defoliating itself, still got loads of blooms. Again, not sure why, we've got the grow lights on it, but for some reason it's just seeming to sense that things are changing and they're very slowly dropping off. It's still needing a lot of water, it's still drying out quite a lot. Um, but I think this particular time is the longest period I've gone without watering it, so and you can see it's still quite damp in there. So I'll move plum plumeria to the warm side. I'm going to slow down on watering the orchids. Um, it's not a case of I'm going to water them like an extra, you know, leave it an extra day or so. It's just like I have done all through the year, really. Um, I've got to be exceptionally careful to check to make sure that they are dried out before I then go and water them. Now, of course, it depends on the orchid, and some don't mind being a little bit more damp and so on. Um, so I'm really carrying on with the same kind of policy that I've done all through the year. But of course, that's going to mean at this time of year, um, I need to be especially, especially careful because they're not going to get the warmth to dry them out as good. Even though I'm keeping the temperatures higher, it's not the same as the sun coming in through the window. Um, we do get that occasionally, but not very much. Um, more October jobs, leaves from gutters. Now the other day, it was chucking it down outside and I saw and heard over here somewhere a drip which was coming down from this uh, this bar across here, like a constant drip coming down. And I thought, well, hang on, where, where's that coming from? And I believe it or not, the gutter outside, I mean, you may know I've got some massive trees overhanging the greenhouse, and the guttering outside, uh, which is, runs just along there, was completely full of leaves, and it must have been overflowing and somehow working its way down and along and dripping. So you've got to keep a real good eye on those gutters because any infiltration of water um, can cause quite a lot of damage. So that was something else that I need to keep an eye on. And as soon as those leaves are sycamores and they'll still be shedding their leaves in December, they're usually done by about mid-December, by Christmas time, I always say. It doesn't matter what the weather is like for the year, they're all just gone by Christmas time. Uh, but they hang on, you know, they hang on quite a lot. That's quite late for a lot of uh, trees. So. I'm going to keep an eye on that and make sure those gutters are nice and clear. Uh, pests, well you may have seen my, or you may have seen my sooty mould video where I had scale insects on this terrace cretica. Um, at this time of year, especially now that the greenhouse is getting completely bubble wrapped and completely enclosed, never, never have a day with anything open anymore. Um, what you find is that the bugs find their way in because they can sense that it's getting cold outside as well, especially when we get frost. We haven't had one yet, but they're not so far off. I think we've had it down to about four degrees Celsius. So when that happens, the plants will very soon build up an infestation. Um, we've talked about this before, the Brugmansia, which is really prone to spider mite. I've got to really keep my eye on these things. And it's not just them coming in and finding their way in the greenhouse. 
as you know, I've brought the Brugmansia in from outside, which has been outside all summer. I've brought the banana in, which has been outside all summer. So just by bringing those in. Now what I did do, I did dunk the pots for like 20 minutes in water. So that the water was like, I don't know, 10 centimeters above the pot. And if you do that for about 20 minutes, then you'll find that most, most insects, most bugs will die and will float to the surface. The only problem there is, of course, if you've got anything on the leaves. Um, and anything small on the leaves will very, very quickly, inside a greenhouse with no predators, it will very quickly build up. So that's something I've got to really keep an eye out for as well, pests. I know there's a slug somewhere down here because I keep seeing its trails. Um, I'm going to have to come in on a night and have a look for that, see if I can find it. So vigilance, definitely the order of the day in October. Um, botrytis is something that keeps cropping up as well. Um, I'm not showing you this because it's got botrytis, just because it's really nice. Um, but, however, cyclamen. Now, I've only got, just had this one for a couple of weeks, and I've noticed that one, one or two of the leaves that started flopping over, and I thought, well, maybe it wants a water. No, had a look. All underneath there, there was about a dozen leaves with botrytis, and it had spread to the leaves, to the stems. Now, just, yeah, I can just show you here now. So, look at this leaf here. Looks okay. Can you see down there? See where it's like? Oh, just pulls off, all soft at the end. Now, I'm thinking it's botrytis. Certainly, the leaves that were at the bottom uh, look like they had it. It could, however, be slug damage. Uh, so what would happen there is the slug would munch away at them and the leaves that were left would then get botrytis or rot. I mean, it's, they, they look very similar. So I'm going to have to keep my eye out for this and see what's going on with it um, just to make sure that there's no little bug in there. Again, it might be something, a job to do on a night time when it's dark to come and have a look. Begonia fuchsioides, uh, something over here that I'm going to have to decide what to do with it because it's almost touching the roof. Uh, obviously that's what I got it for, but we did try, or I did try, and make it into a multi-stemmed plant because it's supposedly a multi-stemmed plant, supposedly a multi-stemmed begonia. And I thought, okay, mine's not multi-stemmed, let's try cutting the top off, which I did, and still nothing. Have a look down there, if you can see it, still single stem. Um, Although, is that one coming from the left there? I've not actually seen that. Can you see that one coming from the left? Maybe that's one. I don't know. I'll have to have a really close look at that and see if it has actually begun to be a multi-stemmed. I'm reluctant to chop it off because I want to see what happens. And it'd be nice to have something with some height in here. So I may well put that on the floor. The other begonia, the Luxurians, I've noticed that one of the lower leaves is beginning to yellow. Now, I would worry about that, except that this is what seems to happen with some begonias. And I'll just move you around here to the griffon over here. That has happened quite regular with the griffon. And I just pull the leaves off and it doesn't seem to cause any, any more damage to it. It seems quite happy. Just some of the lower leaves, for whatever reason, seem to yellow a little bit. So if anyone's got any ideas why this one might be over here, I'm all ears. doesn't appear to have anything on it. So it might just be one of those things that happens with begonias as things. Because obviously things are changing. Like I said, I've got the grow light, but the plants still seem to know. I've got this fuchsia down here, this Delta Sura. And even though it does supposedly lose its leaves in winter, but for some reason, even though I thought, right, well, I'm going to fool it and I'm going to keep the temperatures a little bit higher, keep it watered, it still seems to know. It's still getting yellowing leaves. So maybe it's just some plants, you can't break that cycle. You know, they've they've flowered for so many months, they've been in leaf for so many months. That just might be the length of time that triggers them. I don't know, but it's just it's worth uh, having a little experiment with that and uh, seeing what happens. Still looking great there, look. And another one still looking great. I had no idea these flowered so much. Uh, so many repeat flowers, definitely a plant well worth having. Um, the Oncidium Shari Baby, looking fabulous. Uh, it does smell really, really nice. I'm really pleased with this now. I've got what I wanted. I've got that nice chocolatey smell. 
Okay, so we've talked about that. Try colour minimum still on Tanner. So wandering dew over here. So this one is not looking particularly good now. So again, what's happening to this is sensing the lower temperatures, the high humidity, and it's beginning to get these browning leaves. So that may be, I think, well, probably definitely is going to be uh, a candidate for restarting. I did a video on restarting Triscantia. I'm going to cut it right back. However, the other one that I've got, which is exactly the same plant over here, is not showing anywhere near as much of the browning on the leaves for some reason. There is a little bit. Uh, it may be less humid over here. Maybe it's a drier place, a drier spot in the greenhouse. And you can see the one on the left there. Can you see the new leaves at the top? Much greener, much darker. So you can see that chopping them back like that really does work. It really does work. It's well worth doing and you can get your plant restored to what it was before. My Silamontana over here is definitely not liking the cooler temperatures with the high humidity. You can see what's happening there, the yellowing leaves. I think that may be a candidate for moving over to the warmer side, um, possibly repotting as well because that's beginning to look a little bit tired. Um, new Nepenthes, probably the last one I'm going to show you today. I've got a New Nepenthes over here. Now this one is from a new seller I've not used before. Now this is apparently a very popular Borneo Exotics clone. And it's called uh, Rob Cantlii crossed with Aristolochioides crossed with Spectabilis. Okay. And you can see some lovely pictures there. I can see when they get large, they're going to be really, really nice. You tend to find if they've got colour when they're small, then they get better and better as they get big. I don't know how many years old that is, maybe a couple of years. Um, I hope it's a quick grower. You can see my other very small one. That one hardly ever does anything. That's Hookeriana and Ventrata. That's put more growth on this year than it ever has before. So there are a few more winter jobs, a few more October jobs. Um, I'm really, I've just watered this today. This is my Miltonia, um, sorry, Miltoniopsis Newton Falls. And we've got this really nice growth here and I'm desperate for a spike to come on it because if a spike comes on it, then I will feel completely vindicated and I will have, what's the word? Validation, that's the word, isn't it? I will have validation that I can actually grow a successful Miltoniopsis without killing it. That'll be, I think that'll be my third one. So this one definitely seems to be uh, much healthier than, well, that one down there. I want to keep in that one just to kind of remind myself what happens when you go wrong with a Miltoniopsis. I'm very, very much looking forward to this Lelia Anceps. That's getting bigger as we speak. It's almost, I can almost hear it growing. It, uh, it really, really does seem to grow quickly at this time, you know, once going. You find that with orchids, they do nothing for ages and then all of a sudden everything happens to them. Um, this is really nice, I'm quite pleased with that. It's a shame there's no more spikes on it. Well, that's definitely going to need a repot once that's finished. Uh, my Medusa, Habanaria Medusa. Flower spike's gone on that now, and you know, I've to I did a video on it and I've totally forgotten what the Kerr tips was on it because it, it, it's not to be treated like other orchids, it's to be treated very, very differently. I'm thinking that has to die down, and then there's something I've got to do with it. So, again, I'll have to, to re watch my own video to remind myself. Um, so, I think that'll do for today. A few updates there, a few more October jobs, and I would very much like to hear from people to tell me their experiences even if it's nothing about anything that I've shown I just like to know that somebody's there and on one of my recent videos I only had like two or three comments and it's, sometimes it's like you know shouting into the wind and you feel like nobody's out there it's great to hear from people as I say even if it's just your own experiences if it's nothing to do with what's gone on in my video I would love to engage with you so please put something in the comments even if it's just hi um, well, maybe a bit more than that. <laughs> okay, so that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thumbs up if you did, and I will see you on the next one. Bye.